shut up and dribble. But I'm honored to speak with three incredible basketball players who are not staying in their lane. Donovan Mitchell of the Utah Jazz, Garrett Temple of the Chicago Bulls, and Neka Agwumake of the Los Angeles Sparks. I'm so glad that you're all here for this very important conversation. Donovan, I, I want to start with you and, and the Chauvin trial. What was your reaction when you heard the guilty verdicts? Um, you know, for me, it's funny. It, it's not funny, but I was with my teammates. You know, we all kind of, we asked the same question, you know, when I was with them. And the biggest thing, we were just relieved, but not satisfied. Um, I think that's where, where he was held accountable. Um, we finally got our justice, uh, but there's still more work to do. I think, you know, that's been, that's been my mindset. I think that's been everybody's mindset. Like, this was a step in the right direction, um, but there's definitely um, more work to be done. But um, we're, we're definitely, um, definitely happy, you know, with the result of how it happened. And obviously, we, we wish George Floyd was still here with us um, and prayers out to his family. But we finally got justice, but we're not done yet. We have, uh, we have more to do. Because in many ways, NECA, it was never about just one particular trial. It was about why it was so illustrative of so many other cases that we've heard about, names we don't know. What went through your mind, NECA, when you heard guilty on every single count? Um, well, you know, I, uh, it's, 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 it's disappointing for me because, you know, I'm watching the TV and I'm, I'm hearing the judge read read out the verdict and I'm still anxious, you know, and I don't think it should be the case with something that was so obvious and so blatant. Um, so for me, there was, there was kind of an anticipation that I, I wasn't settled in, but of course, once understanding on all accounts, you know, it really sunk in that, you know, for the longest that so much of this country have, has understood that that verdict was really the only option, although the issue that we have is the anticipation of hearing it, and we need to fix that. I mean, Garrett, you think about it, even with a nine minute and 29 second video, it was still a three week trial. People still had concern, as NECA was talking about, the idea of still being anxious about whether, in fact, it would be a guilty verdict. I mean, we've seen people of color dying at the hands of police over and over and over again with no accountability, which is why that anxiety comes. Was this verdict for you a turning point or just a one-off? Um, I, I think it was, I would hope that it's a turning point. Um, I, I'm not the person that can make that judgment call. Um, but I, I do agree with NECA in, in the fact that um, because there was still that anticipation because there were still people like our parents, um, people, you know, our grandparents that, that just couldn't believe it to be true unless they heard that guilty verdict, even though, as you said, there was nine minutes and 30 seconds of video evidence that showed what the verdict should have been, um, no matter what happened during the trial or whatnot. Uh, as you stated, all of America saw what happened and, and knew what the verdict should have been, but to still have that anticipation, uh, to her point, that is the problem uh, in this country right now. And um, for it to be a turning point, I'd have to see what comes next, because on that day, we know what else happened um, in, in Minneapolis or, or near near Minneapolis. Um, um, and we know what helped happen uh, on that day as well, you know, and somewhere else in America. And unfortunately, it's probably going to continue to happen. But if we can hold police accountable, like Donovan said, Hopefully it happens less and less. You know, Donovan, to your point as well, the idea of you were happy but or relieved but not satisfied in recognition of the work that needs to be done and moving forward and this not being the end of the conversation. I mean, the video of Derek Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck did open up so many eyes to the real depths of racial injustice and disparity. So I'm wondering from you, how can role models like each one of you keep this conversation going in a productive way? When I say role models, I don't just mean for younger people looking up to you. I'm talking about people who are looking to you all to use your platform in this way. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I think the biggest thing is conversations like the ones we're having, you know, just keeping it on the forefront of everybody's brains. You know, one thing I think uh, since the pandemic and everything and George Floyd was really the catalyst to this, I think this is this year or so has been, you know, I think the country has done a great job of continuing to keep it on the forefront 
of everybody's brain. You know, there's been times where this has happened and it kind of dwindles off or goes away, you know, and then we re, we re, re-attack it when it comes back up. I think for, for us as uh, African-Americans continuing to keep our foot on the gas and continuing to, continue to bring light to a situation, you know, I think that's really where it all starts, continuing to bring light to it. Um, I think I agree with Garrett and, 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 and them saying, you know, we don't know if this is going to be a turning point, but it's a good place to start. You know, and I think for us, it's just a matter of continuing to shine light on the necessary situations and holding people accountable of, of doing what doing doing wrong. You know, I think it's so you know laudable that each of you did not choose to use your platforms as merely a form of escapism for the nation to turn their eyes away. It was an opportunity for you, as you talk about, to shine that light, to hold the magnifying and a mirror up. And NECA, I mean, what do you say to people who think that athletes should just stay away from politics? This is not your lane. You know, um, I got asked this question last year in the bubble. And quite frankly, athletes wish that they could just play, but we can't, you know? We're not just players, we're citizens as well. We're members of our communities. And um, we would be remiss not to use our platforms. I know in the W, we've really seen a, a big turning point with how we were able to use our platforms for change. And mm -hmm. in 2021, we have a social advocacy agenda um, that includes racial justice and voting rights. And, and in, a lot of time, in a lot of ways, you know, these pillars that we're standing on in our agenda this year, you know, something like police reform is about both racial justice and public health, you know, because they shouldn't be the ones that are responding um, to mental health uh, calls, you know. And I think that it's important for everyone to understand that um, we need to honor George Floyd. And for us, especially as women in the W, we want to lift up his daughter because, you know, she said that he was going to change the world. And in bringing um, our advocacy to the forefront, not just through what we do collectively, but in conversation, you know, like Donovan said, these conversations need to evolve. And so we're, we're, we're having conversations with the W about members of Congress and how they can do better. And, and we know that both Vanita Gupta and Kristen Clark are exceptionally qualified nominees for the Justice Department. So we need the Senate to confirm them immediately so we can get to work for the American people because... Um, you know, we need people in these seats that are fighting for civil rights for all. Oh, it looks like we must have lost Garrett's shot. So, Donovan, I'm going to give you the last word here. You know, I've, I've got to ask, what is it like to be so revered as an athlete? I mean, people all over the country are wearing your jersey and singing praises. And then when you leave the court, you have just as much of a chance as any other black man of having a routine traffic stop escalate in something that could be deadly? Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's the reality, you know, and um, I think the, the, the craziest part about it, I've been pulled over um, while in the NBA, and, you know, I have a pretty loud car, um, colorful, um, definitely a car that's not, you know, with the music blaring, and, you know, I got pulled over in a neighborhood, a cop that thought I shouldn't be in, and, you know, it was very aggressive, you know, kind of like, what are you doing here? Are you sure you're going home? Said to him, I'm heading home. And it wasn't until I gave him my license that his cold demeanor changed, you know? And so the reason why I continue to speak up is because, like, there are people, there are black men, black women, people of color who can't just hand in their license and get off and, and be able to have their whole the cop demeanor change because they play basketball or they're famous. You know, that's really what I speak for. And... I think that's something we all speak for. And I think at the end of the day, I'm a black man first. You know, I play basketball, I, I do that, and it's great. I'm a black man first, and I would like to speak for black men, black women. Um, and I think that's that's really my biggest push is, as, a, as a role model, as an athlete, because at the end of the day, like you said, um, it can happen to any one of us, you know, once we, especially once we step off that floor, we're, we're a black man, a black woman, we're people of color. And um, I think that's really where it starts for us. I want to thank you all so much for the conversation, and we'll keep going with it. Garrett, Donovan, NECA, so important to hear from you. And thank you for using your platforms in the way that you have to really shine a light and keep moving everything forward. I appreciate it. Thank you.